Good morning. Good morning. Oh. What if we, if we sang together? What would we sing on a Sunday morning about something like, sing with me if you know this. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to me. Let's cut it off there leave you wanting more you just turn to somebody you're near and just say I'm so glad you're here to worship with me today <laughs> all right all right let's let's keep going if you are visiting with us today. If you're a guest of Sharon today, we're so grateful that you're here. There's a lot of places you could have been today, but you've chosen to worship with us. If you're looking for a connection with a church family, we invite you to fill out these connection cards, then we'll reach out to you and see what happens. But we're open to new relationships with new, with new people. Um, we a baseball game some of us the bus is leaving at 4 30 out in the parking lot to the pelicans game They'll, those of you who have tickets know what i'm talking about if you don't you're going to have to drive yourself <laughs> <clears throat> i would thank you that supported the he reigns combined service with the other global methodist churches that happened here last week a uh, wonderful wonderful time for those of you who made that a priority and put it on your calendar uh, and showed up, I don't think you were disappointed. It was a very, very good time to be together with our neighboring churches, and we're, we're blessed by that. Um, I want to recognize these flowers. Uh, these have been sent to us in honor of Suvan's birthday. Suvan, do you know about These are your flowers. Yeah, these are your flowers. I suspect that whoever sent these, a.k.a. your family, would want you to take them home with you to enjoy uh, this week. And inside of your bulletin, there's an invitation to a birthday party for Miss Patsy over here. So look inside for information. I think that's next Saturday or the Saturday, the 19th of August. So good things are happening for sure. We have a lot to celebrate. And it, it's fun, it's exciting. I uh, would like to bring up Ryan Johnson right now to introduce you to him. He'll do a better job of introducing himself than I will, but what you need to know at the minimum is he is our chef for Wednesday evening's night in Napoli lasagna dinner. But there, he's more than that, you'll recognize that in a second. Good morning, church. Thank you, Pastor Jim. Guys, it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, I live in Virginia with my wife and my son, and I have twin daughters that are 17. Yes, they're not here because they have jobs over the weekend. Uh, but yeah, we live four and a half hours away. I want to tell you a quick story about what brought me here. But first, I recognize that I have to make an apology for whosoever seats we just stole. <laughs> I know they are assigned. <laughs> so I've been a lot of things throughout my career, and for the last 20 some years, I've worked in corporate America, and I was called out of it. And God said, I want you to buy a business. I said, That sounds exciting. I'll start looking. And he said, No, 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 I, I want you to buy a business in Brunswick County. Where? <laughs> you know, 
Brunswick County, down below Wilmington. Oh, Wilmington, Delaware, I know that, I grew up near there. No Wilmington, North Carolina. Where? And, and I said, okay, God, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna buy a business. I'm gonna give it to you, but are you sure you want me to go down there? And I did. I came down here and I said, this is your business. You want to do something special in this business, I know. So I gave it to him. I get to share Jesus with so many customers and, and some of my staff, and it's wonderful. I did that in, in December, and something was missing. And six months later, I said, God, I just don't, I don't see why you brought me here. I love the business. Don't get me wrong. I'm so grateful. But why did you bring me here? He says, I'm so glad you finally asked. He says, I want you to get involved in the community. So for over 20 years, I've been in youth ministry. I love youth. Amen. I think it's because I haven't grown up yet, and I hope to never do that. And I tried to walk away from youth 10 years ago when I changed churches and we moved. And he said, I didn't release you. And when I came down here, I go back every weekend and I'm still very, very active in that youth group. But he said, I haven't released you still. You need to follow the passion I put in your heart. Pastor Jim and I have cultivated a relationship over many months with Jim, and one day we just started talking about my passion for youth. And his eyes lit up and he started talking about what's going on here, and how it's really just stopped. And I felt God say immediately, this is why I brought you from the county. So he's moving, and he wants to do great things, and he wants to start here. Okay? So we had the opportunity, what was it, about four weeks ago or so, and we met with many of you guys over at the pastor's office area. And God started laying out a vision. And the first vision that he wanted us to do is to say, it's not just enough to put a sign out in the street and say, you can meet here. He says, you guys need to create a community. A community that brings folks together under one banner, and that's the banner of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And so we decided that to do this, we're going to have fun together. If you look at the disciples and, and the life that they had with Christ, they had a community. They worked hard together. But remember, the first public miracle was at a wedding. They had fun together. Right? They supported one another. And that's what we're going to do here. That's what God wants to do. He wants to build a community, a sub-community from this congregation with your support. Yes. With these youth. Yes. So, Yes, yes, I, I was going to a restaurant. Yes, people call me Chef Ryan. Guys, it is my desire that you recognize the work that the youth are going to put into cooking for you. They are going to show you that they can. There's no junior Holy Spirit. And they can work, and they can partner alongside of you. And so we're going to meet early on Wednesday. We're going to begin to cook the lasagna. Miss Karen and I are going to make tiramisu starting Tuesday night. So we will have that. We're going to have a really, really great time. And I met with four youth this morning. And if you are a sixth grader through the twelfth grader, or if you know of a sixth grader and a twelfth grader, I'm inviting you personally to get involved. Yes. We're going to have a great time this week. And we're going to continue to build on that for a long time to come. And I know you didn't expect me to. <laughs> it's kind of your fault. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I just wanted you, you guys to know, to get to see me, to get to see my family, but to get to hear, more importantly, God's heart in what he wants to do here. Amen. I'm just being an obedient servant. Yes. Awesome. Okay? It is not about me. It's about our Lord. Amen. So guys, great to meet you. I'm going to be outside uh, over here at the <laughs> sign-up table if you guys want to come by and say hello. Uh, but we do invite you uh, to come out for a night in Napoli, Wednesday night, 6 p.m. Thanks.
We still have tickets available, and the tickets are available right there at, the, at that table. So uh, let's, let's fill that room up. We, I think we've sold 53 tickets so far. We could sell at least uh, 10 or 15 more and still be in good shape in that room. So please, please come do it. And if you can't afford $15, Please get a ticket anyway and come. Even if you can only give a couple of bucks or just, or just be nice to Winky for once, <laughs> we want you to come. We want you, please hear me say that. We don't want that to be cost prohibitive, all right? We're building community, not building a bank account. All right. I'm going to call your attention to our prayer list that's inside your bulletin as well as those prayer concerns that have come in earlier today. But join us this week in lifting up Steve Whitfield, Yvette Kirby, Rick and Rennie Lineweber, Brendan Dozier, Sylvia Ludlam, George and Judy Wilson, Francis Hamilton, Kay Laughlin, the family of Judy Galloway, Beverly Lank, Bill and Phyllis Spear, Kendra Neely, and Pat Medlin. And of course, we're, as always, lifting up those who are lost and searching for God. And our prayers internationally focus on the people in Burkina Faso who are also celebrating Jesus today on their Sunday. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd pour out your Holy Spirit on us as we worship you and glorify your name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And in those words... And on that promise, I invite you to stand and join us this morning in singing our praises to the Lord. This first song called The Child of Love, that's what we are. We are children of his love and his promise. This song, we haven't sung it in a while, but it moves a little bit. It has a few nuances, so just follow us along, enjoy the words, and enjoy the tempo. Chasing the high 
does, Winky, he does. We're gonna slow it down a little bit with it as well. These words will really touch your heart. If you take them in, really look at these words. Really, if you're not gonna sing them, just look at these words and really take them in.
praise you this morning. Because of you, it is well with our souls. And only because of you, it is well with our souls. We sing that this morning. It is well with our souls. We praise you this morning for Jesus. For what he did for us on that cross. That it didn't end there. That grave is empty. He sits at your right hand. He takes in our prayers. And he whispers them into your ear. You take them in as fragrant offerings. It is well with our souls. Because you sent the Holy Spirit. Who guides and directs us, Lord. It is well with our souls, Father, because you take care of each and every need that we have. It is well with our souls because you send people to be with us, Lord, to be our friends and our families, Lord, to come around us when we need when we need somebody to, to talk to. You send us this church family, Lord. And you continue to provide. It is well with our souls. We honor and glorify you, Lord, this morning. Receive these praises. Because it is well with our souls. Yes. We love and praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Please have a seat. Some of our kids are out of town this weekend. But if we do have any kids want to come down here and spend a couple minutes with Pastor Jim, I would love to share something with you that I brought. If not, I, it's going to be Sam and me. It could be a lot worse, man. I am so glad that you're here. Today I'm sitting up here because somebody said, I can't see you if you're sitting down there, which is probably true. All right, we got more people coming up. I got a couple of pictures to show you. Um, and if you can't see all these, you can come up and sit with Pastor Jim, too. So don't, I'm, this is for the kids. I'm showing them a picture of what? Bears. Bears. It's really that simple. Uh, specifically, a mama bear and her cubs. A mama bear and her cubs. Do they look cuddly? Mm -hmm. Do you want to go play with them? Roll around on the ground and wrestle and all that kind of stuff? Maybe not. How come? And a mama bear might get mad. You're right. They're right. They, she looks so cuddly. But I want to show you another picture also about a mama bear. There. <laughs> yeah, I'll show the choir this picture. There's a mama bear who somebody got a little too close to the cubs. I don't know if you can see that or not. You can come up and pay 50 cents. I'll show you these pictures <laughs> after the service, after you've bought your ticket to the dinner. But mama bears are serious about protecting their baby bears. It's, it's no joke, is it? Would you, want, would you want this mama bear coming at you? Can you even imagine the noise that's coming out of her? Let's all try it together. Like, wow, mama bear noise. I didn't really come to talk about mamas and their cubs, but it's a way of helping us kind of get an idea of how God will protect us. God will sit with us like this. Jesus often sat with children and loved them and probably them and prayed with them probably played some games with them and was gentle and kind. But Jesus also talked about God being very protective. He said one time, if anybody doesn't treat these children well, 
it's going to be bad for them. And he indicated that God would, would get involved if anybody got it mean to one of God's children. And that's God's children like you, but it's also God's children like all these big people here too. God is serious about protecting us. It doesn't mean we'll never face danger. It doesn't mean we'll never have scary things happen to us. It doesn't mean we'll never get sick. It doesn't mean we'll never fall down and scrape our knee and get a boo-boo. What it means is God is there. We have enemies in this world, but God is there to protect us from those enemies. And he'll help us heal when we're frightened. He'll come and be with us. He'll help our bodies heal when we use medicine and Band-Aids and things. But he'll come into our lives and help us understand that we're never, never, never alone. We have real mama bears out here, don't we? Some of these mamas and grandmas, they know what it means to take care of their kids. And we've got some daddy bears out here, too. So not only is God going to protect you, but all these people are going to protect you as you grow up, too. And someday, maybe you already have a little brother or a little sister that you're protecting. But you will one day have somebody in your life that God will call you to protect. But I just wanted to share that with you today. And I, I just love how cuddly bears are. But I also respect how ferocious they can be. The Bible doesn't talk about Jesus like a bear. But the Bible talks about Jesus like a lion. You think a lion could, does that remind you of a lion roaring? Mm -hmm. And it also says Jesus is like a lamb, more like the animals. So let's pray. God, I pray your blessing on these guys and the ones that aren't here today. May they grow in the confidence of knowing that you have them under your protection. I pray for their moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas and teachers and coaches and everybody else that touches their lives. May they go forward and be protectors too for others who need to be taken care of. In the name of Jesus, I pray this. Amen. All right, you guys. Let's continue in an attitude of prayer. Lord, you are good to us. Your mercies are never ending. Your love for us goes beyond our ability to comprehend. You really do care for us. You know our every need. You're around every corner. You're inside of us. You're in the world that you created. And you are holding all things together like glue. We thank you, God for caring about us, even us. Who are we that you would care about us? And yet the creator of the world cares more than we could ever imagine. As a matter of fact, Lord Jesus, you took upon all of our shame and all of our guilt, all of our hurt and pain and disease and suffering and want, and you allowed yourself to hang on a cross to forgive us for our shortcomings, to show us the true measure of your love for us. You gave your life that we could be forgiven, that we could be set free from addictions, we could be set free from depression and anxiety, that we could be set free from poverty, that we could experience your peace even when our lives are spinning out of control. Lord, you accomplished so much on the cross, and you did it willfully and willingly. You laid down your life that we might have abundant life. Thank you for showing us just a little glimpse of that abundant life this morning as we've come to worship. And we lift up our neighboring churches down the road and across the county and the state and in Virginia, the Johnson's home church, as they worship you today in Haiti, 
in the places in the world where people are having a really hard time just finding a safe place to worship you, Lord. May your covering be over all the earth. Help us to understand how good we have it here. And may we use our freedom to share and witness and to testify to your great love. We lift up those names that were in the bulletin today, praying your mercy and your grace upon all of those situations. You know those situations better than we do. You are intimately involved. We thank you in advance for the answer to those prayers. Continue to sustain us as a congregation. Continue to give us your vision. May we walk in the light of your holy word, the holy Bible that's been given to us as a guide and a lamp unto our feet. Help us to follow you and to bring others along on this life-giving journey that you've called us to. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And I pray this in your name. And now we lift the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I invite our ushers to come forward as we participate in the giving and receiving of our tithes and offerings.
excited about what you're doing in our church family. We dedicate these tithes and offerings to the furthering of your work here at Sharon and to your kingdom. Amen. Now let's join together and say what we believe in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And that he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. i 
Good morning again. Yes. Yes, God, we hear you. Our reading this morning, our lecture reading, is uh, from the book of John, chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as a father knows me, I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them along also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. This is the word of God given to each of us as the children of God. Thanks be to God. Okay, Aaron theater is going to be proudly presenting uh, with the best actors we could find during the strike <laughs> chapter 2 of Ruth so if you have your Bibles with you I invite you to find Ruth in the Old Testament and turn to chapter 2 while we're sort of getting ready <clears throat> we're going to have Boaz over here we're going to have Ruth and Naomi over here. And we're going to have some reapers. We need a couple more reapers who are men. Or somebody that could just say, I'm a reaper, not a grim reaper. Come right over and stand right in the middle. That's going to be the reaping field. All right. <laughs> good. You're doing good. Just right there. Don't fear being a reaper. That was a Blue Oyster Cult reference, if you... Okay, now, what we have here are our characters from last week. We have Naomi, the widow of Elimelech, who has passed away. And we have Ruth, also a widow, but Naomi's daughter-in-law. Over here, we have a man named Boaz that you haven't met yet. And he some unnamed reapers. Their job is to cut the grain. That's all you have to be able to do is that. Let's have a rehearsal. Okay, and then stop every now and then if somebody's... So I'm going to read Ruth chapter 2. Try to get out of the way a little bit. Maybe right here. Okay. Now Naomi had a kinsman on her husband's side, a prominent rich man of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth, the Moabite, said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain, behind someone in whose sight I might find favor. She said to her, Go, my daughter. So she went. She came and gleaned in the field behind the reapers. As it happened, she came to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz came from Bethlehem. Well, you're already here. He said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers, 
To whom does this young woman belong? The servant, <laughs> excuse me, the servant who is in charge, that's you, Audrey, answered him, she is the Moabite who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the reapers. And so she came, and she was, has been on her feet from early this morning until now without resting for even a moment. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Keep your eyes on the field that is being reaped and follow behind them. I have ordered the young men not to bother you. Do one of these, Don. Do one of these. Let's imagine some men had stepped up and become reapers today, but you didn't. But I'm watching you. I've ordered the young men not to bother you. If you get thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. Then she fell prostrate with her face to the ground and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight? that you should take notice of me when I am a foreigner. But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to people you did not know before. May the Lord reward you for your deeds, and may you have a full reward from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you've come for refuge. Then she said, May I continue in favor and find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, even though I am not one of your servants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some of this bread and dip your morsel in the sour wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he heaped up for her some parched grain. She ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. When she got up to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, let her glean even among the standing sheaves, and do not reproach her. You must also pull out some handfuls for her from the bundles and leave them for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening, then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. That's five gallons of barley. She picked it up and came into the town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gleaned. All right. Reapers, you are excused. <laughs> then she took out and gave her what was left over after she herself had been satisfied. Her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today, and where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The name of the man with whom I worked today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he, by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, The man is a relative of ours, one of our nearest kin. Then Ruth the Moabite said, He even said to me, Stay close to my servants until they finished all my harvest. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is better, my daughter, that you go out with this young woman, with his young women, Otherwise, you might be bothered in another field. So she stayed close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvest. And she lived with her mother-in-law. That's the word of God for the people of God this morning. Thank you, friends. Yeah. Oh. If we remember, 
Naomi and her husband Elimelech had left Bethlehem, which was part of Israel, part of the chosen land of the land of milk and honey during a time of famine. And Elimelech took his family, he and his wife and two sons, and went to Moab, which was a pagan country. They, they actually were descendants from an incestuous relationship that had happened between Lot. Remember Lot, the nephew of Abraham? He and his two daughters had children together, and they became the Moabites. And so Ruth is coming out of that pagan territory that was sort of under what you might call a curse in Old Testament terms. And yet God was working it out. Naomi's husband died. Ruth's husband died. And there was another sister. By the, who, her husband died too. And so it left them all three widowed in Moab. And Naomi said, if you remember last week, listen, I, I have to go home because I have nobody here in Moab. And so she went to leave and the two daughters-in-law cried with her, and there was a parting of ways with the first daughter-in-law, Orpah, and she went back to Moab to try to find a new husband. But Ruth gave that speech. Remember that speech she gave to her mother-in-law? Listen, wherever you go, that's where I'm going to go. And your people are going to be my people, and where you stay, that's where I'm going to stay your God will be my God. I think today that's what we really want to focus on. Your God will be my God. Ruth was going to become part of the people of Israel. And where you die, I will die. She pledges her devotion. Meanwhile, Naomi, the mother-in-law, came back to Bethlehem, a broken woman who had stopped identifying as Naomi, which is a more positive word, she said, from now on, I want you to call me Mara, which means bitter. And so that's where we find Naomi and Ruth living back in Bethlehem, the city of bread, as widows, completely at the mercy of God and God's people. That's not a bad place to be, right? At the mercy of God and God's people no matter how bad things are, right, Mitch? <laughs> you got God and God's people, even in the worst circumstances, it can be okay. So the text here is so rich. I could literally keep you here all day, uh, regaling you with every nugget of information that I have heard other people write about, seen, talking about, all that kind of stuff. So I'm just going to boil it down to a few things. It'll still be... A few minutes here, if that's okay. But this is a rich text, and it, it teaches us something about who our God is and what God's plans are and how God redeems us. That's pretty good stuff. I think it's worth taking a look at. Naomi and Ruth were in big trouble as widows. There was no government program for them. There was no tax money sitting aside to give to widows and dependent children. There was no help for orphans either. It was just completely up to the mercy of a community. When somebody became widowed, the best possible outcome would be to find somebody else to marry so that you could join up with that family. When we find Naomi and Ruth today, they haven't found that person yet. And Naomi's prospects were very slim, very slim at her age. They had nothing. They had nothing. This isn't just a story about remembering something that happened that's in the Bible. I would say to you, church, you, Sharon, church family, and I pray that God opens our eyes 
to see the desperate souls living all around us in this community? Will we see them? Will we dare to see them? Will we dare to hear them? Will we dare to embrace them some way? Can they find grace and mercy here? That's the question for us. I won't answer that question, and we'll do that together as a church family. I want to lift up some good choices people have made in this, in this story. Good choices. That's, that means good outcome. They did the right thing. They, whether it was the Holy Spirit working in their lives or they just made good choices. Naomi made a really good choice to go home, to go back to Bethlehem. Her husband, Elimelech, had made a bad choice when things were going bad in Bethlehem, which was still part of the promised land. He left. He didn't trust God enough to work it out. He took his family away from God's country. He took his family away from God's protection and left them vulnerable like that. But Naomi was bright enough to say, I've got to go home. I've got to go home home. She had sort of a, a choice to make, and she was now going to involve Ruth in that too. I have stolen this from a video I was watching the other day of a well-known preacher by the name of Alistair Begg. You know Alistair Begg? And he was quoting somebody else that he thought was pretty clever. This was the choice that Naomi had. Choice number one, I can go back to Bethlehem and have nothing. Yahweh, my God, plus nothing in Bethlehem. That's the first choice. Or choice two, stay in Moab, have everything, but not have Yahweh, my God. What would you do? Go where there's nothing, at least seemingly available, but knowing that God is there. Or staying and taking your chances, knowing for sure that you've left your God behind. But she made the good choice and she went back. I think that act of faith and going back to Bethlehem, the city of bread, it was a great symbol of repentance for us. When we realize we're not doing okay, but we've left God out of our lives, it's always a good idea to repent, to turn back to God, and to trust God with our circumstances. That's a lesson for all of us, not just Naomi. Another good choice. I think Boaz made a good choice by remaining in Bethlehem when Elimelech took off. Boaz stayed. It was the same famine. It was the same miserable conditions that they left, but he stayed. He trusted God, even in the famine. He trusted God's promise. Naomi lost everything in Moab not trusting God. Boaz had not only survived by trusting God, but evidently he had thrived. I don't know how that worked. I just know when they came back, they found this man who was thriving. Praise the Lord, right? <laughs> Trust God. God is faithful. He is a rich man. He's a farmer. Many, many acres. Many, many servants. He's a powerful man. His name means strength. Another good choice, Ruth. It turns out she'd made a good choice by leaving Moab to find a new and better life with Naomi's people and Naomi's God in Bethlehem. By making Naomi's God her God, remember when she said, your God will be my God? By making Naomi's God her God. She'd come under Yahweh's protection. That's a big deal. She'd come under Yahweh's protection. How many of you know that being under God's protection is a good thing? 
I hope you all understand that. The system of mercy established by God that we saw played out here today was actually something that was being lived out that had been given by God to Moses. And we can find this in Leviticus 19. You can look this up yourself. God said to Moses, tell all the farmers from now on when they grow their crops up and it's time to harvest the crops, whether it's wheat or grapes or anything else, when the harvest happens, make sure to not pick the good grain or the good fruit on the outer edges of the field. As a matter of fact, even during the harvest process, let some that drops on the ground, don't pick it up and put it back in the basket. Just let it be. Because we know why, right? Don't take everything you could take from your harvest. Leave some for the people who don't have anything. Leave some for the people who don't have anything, who are willing to literally work for food. They are willing to work for food. And that's what gleaning means. The gleaning process was after the official harvest happened, then the poor and the hungry would come behind their baskets, and they would gather up as much as they could from the gleanings that were left behind. God set this up long before there was anything known as a welfare system. God was setting these people up for mercy and compassion. Now, we don't have a gleaning program here, and most of us aren't big-time farmers, but we... I've been thinking about, we do this here. This redistribution of wealth, this redistribution of resources, Sharon Church is pretty good at it. For example, I was just thinking about this. People that have extra giving so that those who don't have enough get something. How about the blessing boxes out here? Those little, those little yellow boxes. That is exactly what's going on. People that have enough food and then some bring food. If you can sit here and hide out and watch every day. Somebody comes by, they get out of their car with a bag or a box, and they put food in the blessing boxes. And Mr. Don over here, he gathers the food that y'all bring in on Sunday morning, and some of that goes in the blessing boxes. People that have more than they need are giving it to people who drive in later that afternoon or in the evening, and they open up the blessing boxes, and they take what they need. It's kind of like a gleaning thing, isn't it? Second helping. I don't know if you looked in your bulletin today, but I did the math about the second helping food ministry where people who've been on vacation at the beach leave behind food, and then there's some people, many of you are out here, who work with volunteers from this community. They gather the leftover food from the vacationers, and they collect it, and they distribute it. If I have my math correct, since Memorial Day, our community, through ministries that this church is involved with, have collected five tons of food. Leftover food. Five tons, not five tons. That's crazy. And people are getting that food. Some of it's showing up here in our neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor food pantry on Wednesdays and Fridays. That's another gleaning. People bring food in. The church buys food. And every Wednesday and every Friday, people come because they need that food. And we got to talk about the Rose of Sharon thrift store. What's that? People's leftover clothes and stuff. Instead of having their own yard sale and collecting more money for themselves, which we've done that a lot of times in our... These people are just giving their things away. And the volunteers and staff at the Rose of Sharon sell that. The profit comes back to the church, and we bless the community. 
by supporting community services. I don't want to bore you with that, but I also want to say we got to talk about the good things that are happening here. And if you didn't know about those things, you ought to start hanging around and getting involved. <laughs> and people who have extra time are volunteering to drive other people that need drives. And people who have extra time are praying for those people who are in the need of prayer. We are abundantly overflowing into the community. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. <laughs> in Ruth's case, God's protection extended a lot past the gleaning of food to a redeeming relationship with the man Boaz. He developed a relationship with Boaz. We'll talk more about that next week. Some interesting facts about Boaz in rapid fire, but really important. You might want to do your own Bible study. Boaz was a wealthy, influential farmer in Bethlehem, but his mother, according to the Bible, Matthew chapter 1, was a prostitute who'd come from Jericho named Rahab. Have you ever heard of Rahab in, in Joshua chapter 2 who helped those spies when they were scouting out the promised land? Boaz's mother was Rahab. Or at least most biblical historians think that that is who that is. She had risen above her family background. Did you hear that? She had risen above her family background. And Moaz, Boaz evidently had been raised well, was in a position of authority. Second thing about Boaz, he was a man of integrity, and he recognized Ruth's integrity. I think in that scene where he lays eyes on Ruth, I don't think it's more like googly eyes like, oh, who's that? hot number over there. Who does she belong to? I don't think it was like that. I think it was more like, who is that? And they revealed that this is Ruth. And all of the reputation that Ruth had earned by serving her mother-in-law and working hard in the field. She'd been there all day, sweating and getting dirty and working. I don't think she probably looked real good. And yet Boaz inquired about her. I have a theory that seeing Ruth in her vulnerability, I haven't read this from anybody or heard anybody say it, but I was just thinking this week, I wonder if Boaz looked at Ruth and thought of his mom. Who, who was there to advocate for my mom when life had led her into prostitution? Who was there to care and give a darn about her? I'm going to let that skip a generation. I'm going to care for this woman. I'm going to give her this integrity. I'm going to take care of her. Boaz instituted the first recorded workplace sexual harassment policy. Did you catch that? Hey, you guys. Hey, you knuckleheads. When you're taking a break and you're checking her out, you take your eyes and put them somewhere else because she's under my protection. She's under my protection. I don't think he was kidding. And by the way, fill her bag up with extra food because I want to bless her beyond her understanding. Now here's a spoiler alert toward the end here. Boaz, the son of a prostitute, got married. That's the spoiler alert. Got married to Ruth, a Moabite pagan widow. That's pretty interesting. They had a baby and named the baby Obed. Obed had a son by the name of Jesse. And Jesse was the father of David, the giant killing king of Israel. Did you hear that? Boaz, the son of a prostitute, was the grandfather 
of Boaz, who married this pagan woman and started a family together. We're going to hear more about that next week. How awesome is our God? And there's more. The Bible tells us further on in their family tree, there was a man named Joseph who came down through that line in Bethlehem. You know where we're going with this? He married a young woman named Mary. When they went to Bethlehem to pay their taxes, they gave birth to our Lord Jesus. This is special. <laughs> this is special. How about that? Friends, remember, and don't forget, even when the stories of our lives don't seem to be going the way we would want them, God is writing a story in the background that if we will pay attention to it and if we will prayerfully live into it, it will be God's will for our lives. It will be God's plan for our lives. It will be our story that God gave us to live out if we will trust him even when it's hard, if we will trust him even when things don't make sense, if we will trust him when anybody else would just give up. We're under God's protection. We are under God's protection by faith in Jesus Christ. Between evil and oppression and darkness and ourselves is a blood-stained cross. Stained with the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We are under God's protection. We are hidden behind the cross. If you have never made that decision to hide behind the cross of Christ, if you have never made the decision to come under God's protection, which has been made available to everybody on this planet by the grace of God, I invite you this morning even to come and, and to kneel at this altar and pray, Lord, I want to be under your protection. Or perhaps you've wandered off and you're ready to come back. This is time to do that. So I'm going to pray and we're going to sing and we're going to get on with our day. Lord, we are grateful that your holy word speaks to us. You are our good shepherd. You do take care of your sheep. You care more about us than we know. And we love you. I pray for those who are struggling today, for those who are hungry, for those who are lonely, for those who are depressed and anxious, for those who don't really know what it means to be at peace. Pray that they'd find your peace today, perhaps through your people, through your children. We love you, God. Thank you for loving us first. Amen. Well, let us recognize the wondrous love of God by singing our last hymn down on page 292. What wondrous love is this? Please rise if you're able to join us.
uh, singing about that eternal choir of singing for eternity. Guess who'll be in the choir? Ruth, Boaz, Bill. It'll be good. I'm sorry, only four of you. <laughs> but anyway, it's been good to worship with you today. I know we've been here quite a while, but there's still time to get yourself a ticket to the Wednesday's dinner. Don't forget, if you bought a ticket, to show up and enjoy that evening. Spend some time over here just getting to know folks. Again, if you're visiting, we're so glad that you were here with us today. So go under the protection of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.